where he dwells, he dwells alone. Except himself, he chattels none. Well satisfied to be his own whole treasure. Snails have a particular preference for dark, damp conditions. Land snails are essentially creatures of the night. In sea snails, activity is as much regulated by tides as it is by light and temperature. There are those that show most activity at night and others that prefer the day. Limpets on the Channel Islands fo forage for food by night, while those on the Isle of Man forage by day. The reason for this difference is unclear. What both do is to return home to the same specific resting sites after foraging. Such resting sites are areas of rock that have been specially excavated to accommodate the limpet's body. A snail's apparent vulnerability is coupled with an ability to attempt the hostility of its environment and adapt, accept the hostility of its environment and adapt to it. This willingness to survive in a quiet, solitary manner was admired by Francis Ponge, the 20th century French poet. Ponge regarded all snails as saintly creatures, saintly in their obedience to their own nature. He wrote a eulogy to them in which he imagined himself to be a land snail, sensitive and vulnerable in equal measure, but sheltered from the assault of intruders. The snail, he felt, was a friend of the soil, embracing it with its own body, a relationship that precluded the need for any other relationship for the earth provides all the companionship and nourishment that the animal needs. What happiness, what joy then to be a snail's, to be a snail, concluded Ponge, who, like Cooper, was disinclined to believe that the snail's soli solitariness compromised its happiness. The same comforting relationship between snail and soil is echoed in a more recent poem by Semi Selina Hill, where she links snails to women. Women are like gardens where golden snails are walking back and fro in the rain. And as they walk, their curious long feet are feeling for a surface to console them. It is notable that the attributes and personality of the snail has been explored more often in poetry than in prose. There is something about the animal that appeals more to the poetic imagination of writers. Not surprisingly, we find the image of a snail cropping up more than once in the writings of Virginia Woolf. In a piece entitled Mark on the Wall, her narrator speculates what a mark might be might present, whether it's a snail, a rose, rose leaf, or a crack in the wood. The uncertainty triggers a shower of ideas, often disconnected and mirroring a daydream. The reverie is brought to an abrupt halt by a commonplace remark, I'm going out to buy a newspaper. As reality is brought into play, so comes the realization that the mark on the wall is a snail. In Kew Gardens, a snail's own thoughts and tentative movements in a flower bed 
are interrupted by the arrival of a man and woman who stand casting a shadow over the animal as it puts its head into an opening created by a leaf. Their two worlds unwittingly collide. collide. The couple fail to notice the snail, though both take stock before moving on. In both cases, the snail appears to be anonymous, part of the everyday framework of life. And yet, being a live object, it holds its own scrutable personality within the scene. If snail makes only an infrequent entry into adult fiction, they figure much more prominently in children's literature. Here they are afforded more fully rounded human attributes and not always favorable ones. While Punch has praised the snail's solitude as saintly, in Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Snail and the Rosebush, the snail is interpreted as a selfish creature full of his own self-worth and incapable of moving forward both in the physical and in the metaphoric, metaphorical sense. By way of contrast, the rose bush in the story blossoms in gladness each year, rejoicing in the growth and strength she derives from the earth. Here is an optimistic view of the world, the snails a uh, misanthropic one. A behavioral ecologist once remarked that snails survive in hostile changing environments by doing the right thing at the right place at the right time. Alan Cook responded to this by suggesting that in case of the land snail, the right thing was to do nothing and the place to do, to do it was in a place of concealment and that the time to do it was an, as often as possible. Certainly, it can spend a lot of time in a stage of inactivity avoiding extremes of heat and cold, dehydrating its body after dry spells, and resting after its forays to find food. Like Oblomov, inaction should not be taken to imply an absence of cerebral activity. Ronald Chase has shown that neutral activity in snails persists a month after going into suspended animation. The snail's mind remains busy even in its dormant phase. The snail is no cuddly creature but can attract a certain fondness. A great deal of the attractiveness of the snail can be attributed to the animal's most defining characteristic, slowness. The quality is, I suspect, admired more than the animal itself. The picture of a solitary but contented life conducted in a slow lane brings to mind that other shelled creature, the tortoise. Each animal has a ready-made home into which it can retreat, something that is part of it, rather than a separate structure. Both have slow habits and both hibernate when the weather becomes unfavorable. If they have a particular attitude towards life and mankind, it is very likely to be a similar one. Similar one. Varling Klinkenborg has written a book which he attempts to see the human world through, a, through the eyes of a tortoise. And as much of what is, what is said there might 
reasonably apply to a snail to a snail for example human beings are viewed as tottering two-legged stilt gained stilt stilt gated beasts who conduct their lives at an unhealthy pace or oh, to live such a long lives at such terrible speed and to get no farther than if they had lived more slowly. Klinkenbog Bogs taught us observed, a snail would doubtless agree.